All right. Welcome to the Neuralink show and tell. The overarching goal of Neuralink is to create a, uh, ultimately a whole brain interface, a generalized input output device that, in, in, you know, in the long term, literally could interface with uh, every aspect of your brain, and in the short term, uh, can ask, can interface with uh, any given section of, of your brain and and uh, solve a, tr a tremendous number of things that that. Uh, cause de debilitating issues for people. So, so you, you want to be able to read the signals from the brain. You want to be able to, to write the signals. Uh, uh, you want to be able to ultimately do that for the entire brain. Um, and then also extend that to uh, communicating to the rest of your nervous system if, there's a, if you have a, a, a sort of a severed spinal cord or neck. I've often said that prototypes are easy Production is hard. Um, it's really, I'd say, a hundred to a thousand times harder to go from to have, go from a prototype to a device that is uh, safe, reliable, works under a wide range of circumstances, is affordable, um, and done at scale. We've submitted, I think, most of our paperwork to the FDA, and we're, we're we think probably in about six months we should be able to have our first neural link in a human. So. Before we would even think of putting a device in an animal, we, we do everything we possibly can with rigorous benchtop bench testing. So we're not cavalier in putting devices into animals. Uh, we're, we're extremely careful, and uh, we, we always want the device, whenever we do the implant, uh, if it's in a she sheep or a pig or a um, monkey, to be confirmatory, um, not exploratory. Let's see, and since, since the pager demo, uh, we've expanded to work with a troop of six monkeys. Uh, we've, uh, we've actually upgraded pager. Um, they do varied tasks, um, and we do everything possible to ensure that, that things are stable and rec replicable and that, things la that the device lasts for a long time uh, without degradation. And um, here you can see uh, Sake, that's one of our other monkeys, uh, typing on a keyboard. Now, he's, it, this is telepathic typing. So to be clear, this is the, the he's, he's not actually using a keyboard. He's moving a, a, the cursor with his mind uh, to the highlighted key. Now, now technically, um, uh, we can't, can't actually spell and uh, <laughs> so I don't want to oversell this thing uh, <laughs> because that's, uh, that's the next version. Um, so the, but what's really cool here is, is um, Sake the monkey is moving the mouse cursor using just his mind, moving the cursor around to the highlighted key, and then spelling out what we, uh, you know, what we want, something that could be used for, for somebody who's, who's say, uh, 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 quadriplegic or tetraplegic uh, human, um, even before we make the, the, the spinal cord stuff work. Uh, is being able to con uh, control a mouse cursor, control a phone, um, and we, we're, we're confident that, you, that uh, someone who is, has basically no other interface to the outside world would be able to uh, control their phone better than someone who has working hands. And I mentioned upgradability. Upgradability is very important because uh, our first production device will be much like an iPhone 1. And, um, I'm pretty sure you would not want an iPhone 1 stuck in your head if the iPhone 14 is available. Um, so it's going to be, it's, um, being able to demonstrate full reversibility and upgradability so you can re remove a device and replace it with the latest version or if, if it stopped working for any reason, um, re replace it. It's, it that's, that, that's a fundamental uh, requirement uh, for the device at Neuralink. I think it's also important to show that um, Sake actually likes doing the demo um, and is not like strapped to the chair or anything. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, so um, like our monkeys are pretty happy, you know, so as you can see, a quick decision maker on the fruit front. The, the, the first two applications we're going to aim for in humans um, are restoring uh, vision and uh, I think this is like notable in that even if someone has never had vision ever, like they were born blind, 
uh, we believe they can, they, they can, we can still restore vision. Um, so, uh, because the, the visual part of the, the visual part of the cortex is still, still there. And then the, uh, the other application being in the motor cortex, uh, where we would initially enable someone who uh, has no ability, to, almost no ability to operate their, their muscles, you know, sort of like a sort of Stephen Hawking type situation and um, enable them to operate their phone faster than someone who has hand, working hands. Um, but then even, obviously even better than that would be to bridge the connection. Um, so uh, take, take the, out, the signals from the motor cortex and um, let's say somebody's got a broken neck, uh, then uh, bridging those signals to neural link devices located in the spinal cord I think we're, we're confident there are no there are no physical limitations to enabling full body functionality. How do you create a high bandwidth generalized interface to the brain? So our first steps along these dimensions for our device is what we call the N1 implant. It's a size of, of about a quarter, and it has over 1,000 channels that are capable of recording and stimulating. It's uh, microfabricated on a flexible thin film arrays that we call threads. It's fully implantable and wireless, so no wires, and after the surgery, uh, the, the implant is under the skin and it is invisible. It also has a battery that you can charge wirelessly and you can use it at home. Unlike many consumer electronic devices, which can simply offer a physical connector, charging a fully implantable device poses several unique challenges. First, the system must operate over a wide charging volume without relying on magnets for perfect alignment. The system must be robust to disturbance and complete quickly so as not to be overly burdensome. However, most important is safety. In contact with brain tissue, the outer surface of the implant must not rise more than two degrees C. Our current production charger, which charges our current generation of implants, is implemented in an aluminum battery base, which also includes the drive circuitry. A remote coil, four times the size of our original device, also uh, disconnectable. This, uh, this remote coil has uh, increased uh, switching frequency, driving improved coil coupling. I'd like to show you one of these applications here uh, with a device we call our simple charger. And the coil has been embedded into the habitat uh, with the addition of one new outer control loop plus a banana smoothie pump, uh, the troop has been trained to charge themselves. On the right, we're streaming real-time diagnostics from Pager's N1. When he climbs up and sits below the coil, you can see the charger automatically detect his presence and transition from searching to charging. We see the regulated power output on a scale of zero to one and the current driven into his battery. So similarly, for implanting our device safely into the brain, we built a surgical robot that we call the R1 robot. It's capable of maneuvering these tiny threads that are only on the order of a few red blood cells wide and inserting them reliably into a moving brain while avoiding vasculature. It's, it's quite good at doing this um, reliably. And in fact, because we've never shown an end-to-end -end insertion of a robot in action. Uh, we're going to do a live demo of the robot doing surgery in our brain proxy. So who wants to see some insertions? <laughs> so here it is. That's our R1 robot with our patient alpha who is lying comfortably on the patient bed. Uh, this is what we call the targeting view. So what you're seeing is this is a picture of our uh, brain proxy. And the pink represents the cortical surface that we want to insert our electrodes into, and the black represents the vasculatures that we want to avoid. And what you're seeing is these hash marks with numbers that represents where we intend to put each of our threads. So this is another view real quick. Uh, on the left is the uh, view of the insertion area, and on the right, uh, what the robot's going to do is it's going to peel the array, uh, the threads, one by one from its silicon backing and insert it into the targets that we uh, predetermine in the targeting view. So. There you go. That's the first insertion. <laughs> so 
So we're going to see a couple more insertions. The whole process of inserting uh, about 64 threads in our first product is going to be around 15 minutes uh, for this robot. To get an N1 device, it's essentially these steps. Targeting and the incision, drill the craniectomy, remove the tough outer meningeal layer called the dura, then insert the thin flexible threads of electrodes, place the implant into the hole we created, and then that's it. You've got an implant under the skin. The surgical robot does the thread insertion part of the surgery. This is because it would be very difficult to do manually. The rest of the surgery is done by the neurosurgeon. There's still a lot for us to do to get to that procedure where we reduce the role of the neurosurgeon and make it affordable and accessible. The primary, uh, the two elements of the surgery that demand the most skills from the neurosurgeon are the craniectomy and the directomy. You've gotten to hear about the advancements we've made over the past year. We've improved implant robustness, battery and charging performance, Bluetooth usability. Realistically, every new device version is going to be significantly better. We need to keep this new technology accessible for our early adopters. This means that we need a solution to make device upgrade or replacement just as easy as it is to initially install. We've explored many different avenues for designing around this healing process and finding a solution to make device upgrade seamless. Our best successes have come from making the procedure less invasive. Instead of directly exposing the brain's surface, we instead keep the dura in place, maintaining the body's natural protective barrier. The same properties of the dura that make it a good protector of the brain also make it really difficult for us to insert the threads into. In humans, the dura can be over a millimeter in thickness, which doesn't sound like a lot, but compared to our 40 micron needles, it actually is a lot. For example, if you scaled up the needles to the size of a pencil, the dura would scale to over four inches in thickness. Take a look at how far you have to zoom in to even see it. By the time the features of the needle come into frame, you could see individual red blood cells in the same frame. One challenge is that we have to use the needle and the ca protective cannula that it sits in to grab onto the thread and to hold it while we peel it from this protective silicon backing. And then we have to keep holding it while we bring it over to the surface and then release it from the cannula during insertions. Another challenge is that the brain is really soft beneath the tough dura. And so if the needle isn't sharp enough, it'll just keep dimpling the surface without puncturing. And if this free length gets too long, it can actually just buckle the needle like this. Another challenge is that we don't just have to get the needle through, we have to get the thread through as well. Uh, so we really have to focus on optimizing the combined profile of the needle and thread together. It's very typical for us to have our engineers who design also work on the physical manufacturing line to build and debug. And this has been extremely, extremely critical in reducing our iteration cycle time. And we've also uh, scaled up our surgery. So we now have a dedicated, our own OR, in fact, a double OR uh, in Austin. And this is just a stepping stone before we um, eventually build our own Neuralink clinic. So with this product, N1 and R1, our initial goal is to help people with paralysis from complete spinal cord injury regain their digital freedom by enabling them to use their devices as good as, if not better, than they could before the injury. And as Elon mentioned, over the last year, this has been the central focus of the company. And we've been working very closely with the FDA to get approval and to launch our first in human clinical trial in the US, hopefully in the six, uh, in next six months. The primary purpose of this update is recruiting. So this is, if there's one message I want to convey, it is that if you have expertise in creating advanced uh, devices like watches and phones, computers, uh, then your, your capabilities uh, would be of great use in solving uh, these important problems.